again, transmission. Well, all's well that ends well, I suppose. And as we wait for your arrival in uh, the next 50 to 60 years, depending on when the launch window is, it's going to be important for us to uh, keep living, um, establish a nice base camp, explore the area, and hopefully make some friends. One animal that I'm particularly um, keen on getting better acquainted with is this adorable mammal that's been hanging around our habitat for a while. Um, at night it comes, uh, comes closer and I've been feeding it little scraps of food and every day I feel like um, our bond is just growing greater and stronger. Um, this, is, this is a wolf uh, cub. It's a pretty young wolf. Wolves are usually pack animals, but this one's solitary. Probably either his, his pack uh, was killed um, or he got um, run out for being um, an old male. And so he, right now he's, he's solitary, and I just, I just feel kind of a bond with him. And I don't know if it's because he's a pack animal and I'm a, um, you know, I'm a social creature as well, but it's, it feels like when we look at each other, we understand each other and we can communicate with each other. And so I think, I think this has um, uh, the promising start of hopefully a friendship that will last uh, me a lifetime. And today we'll finish our discussion on mammals, talk about all the different glands that mammals have and um, reproduction, and then talk a little bit about monotremes like the platypus and then marsupials like wombats. All right, now mammals have a whole lot of glands, uh, sweat glands, sebaceous glands, mammary glands, scent glands, and we're going to go through them each at a time. First of all, the sweat glands. Uh, mammals are uh, the only animals that sweat like we do. They're specialized glands that secrete um, a liquid onto the skin. And because of the high index, uh, heat index of water, uh, it can evaporate. Once it evaporates, it relieves the skin of a whole lot of heat. <clears throat> and so this is a fantastic adaptation to cooling off and allows mammals to expend high energy in even hot places. Humans are um, well known for our sweat glands all over our body because uh, we don't have a lot of hair. If you have a lot of hair like a dog, um, then oftentimes it's just the pads of their feet that have sweat glands and they release their heat through panting. Hippos have a famous kind of secretion called blood sweat, which isn't technically a sweat, but it is made from um, specialized hippo um, epidermal glands that secrete this thick oily substance that is um, pinkish red and it almost looks like they're bleeding but it prevents sunburn and helps um, prevent um, getting waterlogged when they're under the water for hours at a time. There are two broad categories of sweat glands, eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. Eccrine sweat glands you can see here are not always associated with hair follicles, they're just associated with the, the epidermis, and their primary function is heat regulation. And this is what you think of when you think about sweat. The sweat is gonna be mostly water, but it's also gonna have some salts in it. So sweat can also function in an osmoregulatory sense as well. In contrast, the apocrine glands are always associated with the hair. They're usually much more highly convoluted, and they secrete a thicker, almost yellowy um, secretion that's not useful for heat regulation. Um, epocrine sweat glands develop and start excreting their um, secretions during puberty and during sexual maturation, and they're pri primarily found in the armpits and groin and the ear canals for some reason. And their function seems to be related to reproductive cycles, but we're not 100% sure what it is. When uh, the secretion dries on the skin, it produces a kind of pungent odor, which is kind of what you think of when you think about like human, human body odor is made by apocrine sweat glands. And um, similar to sweat glands, but not quite the same, are sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are associated with hairs and they secrete a, an oily substance called sebum that helps to lubricate um, and oil the hair to, to create a beautiful, luxurious, um, oily hair. So it helps make it water resistant and uh, durable and pliable. So it's a sebaceous glands is kind of a, a good oil. It won't turn rancid. And um, so that's secreted by seba sebaceous glands. Scent glands are another thing that uh, mammals are famous for. And scent glands have a lot of functions. 
one of the most famous functions is for defense. So these cute little baby skunks have a very potent scent gland at the base of their tails that they will use to spray attackers with a uh, just a overwhelmingly strong, terrible smell. But if you, uh, if you, for, for me, sometimes if I smell a skunk um, outside, it just reminds me of home. So there's, there's kind of a nostalgic scent of um, skunk to me. I kind of like the smell of skunks, honestly, in, in the small quantities, of course. Um, but the purpose of the skunk scent gland is to scare away its predators and to teach people not to mess with skunks. Scent can also form a really important um, communication to conspecifics. So most mammals mark their territory boundaries with scent markings. Usually these scent glands are found on the face or um, are found next to the anus. So whenever they're um, excreting waste or urinating, they are mixing in their own smells with it. Beavers have a particularly pungent um, scent gland in uh, near their anus and they use it to mark their territories. But humans, <clears throat> in human history, humans, um, I don't know how, don't ask me how, but we figured out that this particular uh, pungent, oily chemical tastes delicious. And it tastes like vanilla and raspberry. And for a lot of human history, um, vanilla and raspberry flavoring comes from uh, the anal secretions of beavers. So if you see if you see a product which with natural um, raspberry or natural vanilla flavoring, it is entirely possible that it came from a beaver's butt. So here you can see on a cat the um, the anal sac right here next to the anus, and they're going to have um, glands all over. And if you th if you have a cat, think about where the cat rubs you when it comes up to you and rubs across your legs. Where does it rub? It rubs its cheek and its head and then its butt and its tail. So it is intentionally marking you as um, its territory. It's saying um, it's covering you in their own particular scent so any other cats will know that you belong to him or her. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this little guy is testing the reproductive um, cycle of the female. So sometimes the scent can be correlated with um, the estrus cycle and whenever the female is receptive to mating. I'm not sure if that is a uh, yes or a no, but uh, regardless, sometimes the, the males can sense whether a female is in heat because of the way they smell. The, the last important glands, glands of uh, mammals are the mammary glands. And these, as I said earlier, these produce the milk and create a strong bond between mother and offspring. And in blue whales, this is incredible. Blue whales are the largest animal on the planet and they can get about 100 feet long. And their milk, they can, they can make about 50 gallons of milk a day. And when a baby blue whale is born, uh, the milk is about 50% fat. And so that little baby blue whale can grow by eating this 50, these 50 gallons of milk, they can grow 10 pounds every hour. So every hour throughout the whole day, on average, they're growing 10 pounds. So you know, day one to day two, they're 250 pounds heavier in a single day because of uh, this amazing milk. Mammals display a whole host of different feeding strategies from insectivores to herbivores and predators, and each have a correspondingly different um, digestive system. So insectivores, insects are really high in protein and nutrients, and I like this anteater, which is just a fantastically weird looking creature, right? It has a, has a tongue that's as long as its head that it can extend out to um, slither through termite mounds and incredibly large clawed legs that will rip into um, termite mounds, um, again, for the, getting the ants and the termites that it can find. But insects are so high in protein, it doesn't need a long convoluted digestive system to extract all those nutrients. So instead, insectivores generally are gonna have a small intestine and a relatively short, small intestine, and relatively, relatively short, large intestine as well. And um, they're not gonna have any, or they're gonna be, have a highly reduced um, gastric cica. So if you can kind of, I want you to pay attention to the length of the intestines and the presence and size of the, the cecum. So insectivores, short intestines, no cecum. This is 
another really fantastic animal, one of my favorites. This is a pangolin, and its epidermal um, hairs are modified into these really interesting overlapping scales, which makes it this kind of armor-plated animal. It can roll into a ball for protection and just looks like a, a creature from another world. But they're also insectivores, just like the anteater. Ruminants, um, so herbivores have a distinct challenge, and that is how do we get the nutrients from um, cellulose that's present if we can't digest cellulose ourselves. So um, almost all life forms, as you, as you guys know, have to rely on symbiotic bacteria to digest their cellulose for them. Ruminants choose to do this in a unique way. Ruminants like giraffes and their close relatives, the okapis, and uh, most cattle, sheep and, sheep and goats. Um, these guys have a four-chambered stomach, the rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum. And this four-chambered stomach um, has distinct um, functions. So the rumen is what, what gives the ruminants their name, and that's the first chamber where the food initially goes. So mechanical digestion occurs in the mouth as they chew up the grass, and then they swallow it and goes into the rumen, and then the rumen has um, some symbiotic bacteria and protists that start breaking it up, but um, they it still needs more mechanical digestion. So after the rumen has set in, um, after the food is set in the rumen for a while, they regurgitate it back up to their mouth and then chew it some more. So instead of having gastric teeth in their stomach, they just um, bring it back up and chew it with their teeth in their mouth. So this is what's called chewing your cud. And then the, the cud is then swallowed again. It might be brought up several times, but eventually it's going to pass to the reticulum and the omasum where a lot of the, um, the water is absorbed and a lot of the symbiotic bacteria and protists are digested. And then the abomasum is, you can kind of think of that as a true stomach. So that's the acid digestion place. Um, and then uh, furthermore, you're gonna have a really large cica um, a really large sea gum, I should say. Um, they have very large cica, and uh, their large intestine has a distinct spiral loop. So all of this, uh, the, sea, the large cecum just harbors a whole lot of um, bacteria, and the spiral spiral loop just increases the surface area and time that it takes to dig digest the food. So to be a ruminant, you have to have a very, very extensive digestive system, and you have to be eating a whole lot of um, uh, pounds of food to get the nutrients you need to survive. But you don't have to go out and chase it, right? Grass is just sitting there waiting to be eaten. Non-ruminant herbivores, if uh, they still have the same problem, how do we maximize our uh, the efficiency of our eating? Um, this is a Patagonian mara, a relative of the rabbit. It's just kind of a, a very interesting looking rabbit. And rabbits are non-ruminants, but they are um, herbivores. And so rabbits do something called um, coprophagy, where you can notice here that they have a very large um, cecum as well, and an extensive large intestine, but they're missing that four-chambered ruminant stomach. And so what they do uh, is called coprophagy, and this means uh, poop eating. So after the, the food passes through their body once, they will eat it again and do the whole system again. So it's kind of just a more extensive recycling than the ruminants do. The ruminants recycle it kind of halfway through and the non-ruminants recycle it um, all the way through. Because there's still a whole lot of uh, nutrients even after one entire pass to the whole digestive system of a rabbit, there's still nutrients left to be had in that, in that food. Uh, koalas have a particularly distinct challenge because um, they only eat eucalyptus and only eucalyptus. <clears throat> and even then, they won't eat eucalyptus if it's just given to them. It has to be on a branch, on a tree. Um, so if you take a bunch of leaves of eucalyptus and give it to them, they actually don't know, recognize that it's food and they will starve to death before they eat um, eucalyptus on a plate. But um, the eucalyptus is kind of toxic to most life forms. So not a whole lot of things eat eucalyptus. And the koalas have to have the special bacteria to digest eucalyptus. <clears throat> but when they're born, they don't have it. So how do you think the little baby koalas get this bacteria? Well, they eat their mother's poop. So the mother secretes a, a, a fecal, these special fecal droplets um, right, right after the koala baby is born. And the koala baby um, slurps that up and then gets colonized by the symbiotic bacteria.
Nice. Carnivores like this intense looking um, fusa from Madagascar are going to eat a lot of protein, a uh, diet high in protein. So like the insectivores, they're not going to need a large um, cecum and they're not going to need a very long intestine. So carnivores, short intestine, short um, cecum. Mammals are also famous for their migrations, and mammals migrate for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> you may be uh, familiar with one of the most famous ones, uh, the wildebeest migration. Um, although it's not just wildebeest migrations, uh, it's not it's not just wildebeest that are migrating at this time. A whole host of herbivorous animals make a, a giant trek across um, the the savanna, and what they're doing is they're following rains. <clears throat> so during they're following the, the the rainy season, so they can always go where rains are bringing them um, food. So some animals migrate across great distances and traverse crocodile-infested waters to get food and to not starve. Others, like caribou um, in, the, in the north, caribous have the longest mammalian migration on um, the planet, uh, over a thousand miles in, in length, <clears throat> and they do this primarily to avoid invertebrate pests. So they're not really following the food, and uh, they actually go north into the cold, and they go higher up into the altitudes, further into the cold, to escape from mosquitoes and botflies. So during the peak of um, the, the summer, when they're being hounded by these hordes of um, flying, biting insects, they can lose over a liter of blood a day just to uh, these biting flies. And the bot flies uh, follow them around and lay eggs inside their noses. They're called snot bots. And it's very painful and debilitating to the caribou. So the caribou actually go north and go into higher elevations um, where the insects can't live to avoid um, the insects. So you can migrate for resources or you can migrate away from uh, dangers, uh, pests and predators. Or like um, fur seals, a lot of mammal migrations happen to um, coincide with breeding um, seasons. So in fur seals, the males and females live most of the life, uh, most of the year separate. And then during breeding season, they all come together on these, uh, in these massive colonies on islands for breeding and reproduction. Once the reproduction occurs, the males will leave and go off on their own and the females and the pups will leave and go off um, in the other direction. So um, breeding, pests, and resources are the three primary reasons why mammals migrate. Reproduction in mammals is always dioecious. There's no parthenogenetic um, mammals, as far as I can tell. So it's, uh, sexual reproduction is required. And the, the life cycle of, of mammals is often heavily influenced by estrus. So most mammal species, the, the females are receptive to mating during one particular time of the year or two. So estrus refers to when the female is reproductive to mating. So this is gonna coincide with um, her ovulation. So when the egg is, is ready to be fertilized. And if there's a consistent period when females are receptive to mating, this is the breeding season, right? This is what I was talking about, the fur seals. So the vast majority of mammals um, have a breeding season and there's one particular animal, this um, um, Antonychus. This is a tiny shrew-like marsupial in Australia, and they only live for a year. And at the end of this year is the breeding season. And male, these, these male shrew-like animals um, go on a breeding frenzy. They will mate with anything that they can, um, they can catch. And the, it's just for about two weeks, they uh, will mate for about 14 hours a day and not do anything else. They won't eat or sleep. They will just run around trying to find as many females to mate with as possible. Their organs will start to fail and their muscles will atrophy. Their, um, their blood vessels will burst and their brain will start hemorrhaging. And they basically have sex until their body disintegrates and then they die at the end of this. So it's this frenetic um, sexual... Um, peak and then they die. So a uh, one year life, um, this is, we talked about this kind of reproductive strategy a while ago, it's called um, simul parity, where you only reproduce once in your lifetime. Having a breeding season and an estrous cycle 
also generates a whole lot of selectional pressure on males for competing. So this is why a lot of horns and antlers develop and a lot of um, mating behaviors develop is because there's one particular time when females are receptive to mating and uh, during that time you need to make sure you get a mate. <clears throat> so this uh, leads to a lot of conflict between males for, for those mates. Another interesting feature of this is um, something called delayed implantation. So when the egg is usually fertilized and then will implant in the uterus for development, but because mammals are terrestrial and often live in environments with winters, um, and winters are usually times of resource scarcity, delayed implantation means that the embryo can enter a state of diapause. This is also called embryonic diapause, and the embryo will um, basically stay in stasis until the environmental conditions are good for birth. And so that's why most of the time in spring, spring is when mammal babies start coming out and it's a nice happy new lifetime. It's because um, a lot of mammal species have the ability to delay the implantation of the embryo until the resources are good again. Humans and some other animals, um, some primates and a few bat species and a few uh, rodent species, uh, we don't have an estrus cycle, rather it's a menstruation cycle. And the primary difference here is that the endometrial lining of the uterus right here, which is usually where the embryo would implant, if no fertilization occurs, then the endometrial lining um, in, an, in, um, in an estrus cycle is reabsorbed into the uterus, but in the menstruation cycle, it's shed uh, periodically. So uh, menstruation, um, is the shedding of the endometrial lining after fertilization doesn't occur, and it usually occurs um, about monthly. What I think is really interesting, if you notice over here, this is the ovary, so the egg is produced here, and um, then this is the, the oviduct, the fallopian tube, and what's uh, what I find really interesting is that the, the oviduct and the ovary aren't connected. So when the egg is released from the ovary, it has to cross this from a microscopic egg perspective, this enormous chasm um, that just kind of leaps off into space and then the little cilia on um, these fimbri co collect the egg and funnel it into the oviduct. So it's just crazy that each of us began our life as a little egg jumping across this enormous chasm. If the egg doesn't make it and if sperm makes it up here and uh, the egg fer is fertilized up here, this is how you get an ectopic pregnancy, which is uh, really dangerous because this is not where the baby is supposed to be growing. So usually the egg is fertilized in the oviduct and then um, the egg is implanted on the, um, the endometrial wall here and then the uterus expands during uh, pregnancy. So uh, menstruation occurs in humans and a few other animals, but most mammals um, have an estrus cycle. Now a few strange mammals, the monotremes and the marsupials. The monotremes, um, their reproduction is quite different because they don't, um, uh, they, they don't give live birth. They're viviparous. So they make a little nest and lay these leathery eggs. Um, even, even still, the little babies um, get milk from their mothers and their mothers are covered in fur. So they are mammals, just different very different mammals. Duck-billed platypus like this use their duck bills to um, find the detect electrical currents and vibrations underwater of their earthworm, crustacean, um, invertebrate prey. They have nice webbed feet, and the males are have a very toxic venom in their hind um, hind legs that they use for protection and for fighting rival males. Echidnas are the, own, are the other monotremes that um, we know about, and they are similar to platypus in that they lay eggs, but their hair is modified into quills, and they, um, they are usually insectivores, although the long-beaked zayglossus um, likes to eat earthworms. Marsupials are the, the third lineage. <clears throat> so marsupials are a very diverse group in Australia, and like I was saying earlier, they've kind of um, colonized every conceivable um, habitats, every conceivable niche, so trees, grounds, underground, water, air, um, etc. The the macropods, uh, the giant feet group. These are this is a group that include kangaroos, and kangaroos are just so strange. They're they're just a strange looking um, creature, and if we weren't as familiar with them as we are, um, 
we would be astounded by how unusual they are. They're kind of bipedal uh, with these long, thick, muscular tails. And the, the red kangaroo, the males, can get over six feet tall and can be quite, uh, quite robust um, and uh, aggressive. Even, they've been even known to uh, deliberately drown dingoes, the, the predatory dog. They'll, they'll take them to water and drown them as a defense mechanism. So these guys aren't really to be trifled with. Um, but you have marsupials like this. You also have some marsupial predators that, um, this is a marsupial lion that's about the same size as, as, a, as a lion. Um, it's extinct now, but you can see it's got these massive claws that we use to disembowel its prey. You also have animals burrowing marsupials like the wombat, which has a hardened plate-like um, uh, rump, so it can kind of burrow into its hole, and then it's got a protective shield on the back. The pouch on marsupials carries their young, which are little tiny, um, almost, almost uh, still embryonic um, creatures, um, and then they will mature in their pouch for, for several uh, months until they're uh, mature enough to explore the outside world on their own. The wombat's pouch um, faces backwards though, which is somewhat strange, but um, so it has that fouling problem, right? It's not pointing forward, it's pointing backwards. But if you think about it, this is a burrowing animal, and so if you have a pouch that's facing um, anteriorly, all the dirt would just fill up the pouch. So it's face, facing posteriorly, so it can dig, so the, the adult can dig without filling its pouch with dirt. Another interesting thing about wombats is that their poop is cube-shaped. And we don't know really exactly why, but it's shaped like, uh, like little cubes. It's, they probably just have a, a really specialized uh, morphology of their rectum, and when it squeezes all the moisture out, it just ends in little cubes, which is interesting. The very last animal I want to show you is this happy little macropod, a very small uh, kangaroo relative called the quokka. And the quokka is often called the, the happiest animal on earth uh, because it's kind of got a perpetual smile on its face. They're usually pretty gentle. Um, there's not a whole lot of them um, around. They're kind of uh, restricted to small islands around Australia, uh, but really just adorable creatures. And I thought I'd end with a nice happy picture for you. After Vector's demise and the captain's change of heart, I feel confident that we can move forward with this, uh, this colonization event without uh, too much difficulty. So uh, Isab Isabella has um, started to recover remarkably well. We've administered some of the, the axolotl uh, regenerative serum to her brain, and we can already see some really promising results. So I'm sure Charlie will take good care of her. Uh, but the four of us that are left, Charlie, the captain, Isabella, and I, um, we haven't heard from Dave since I left him out in the woods yesterday, but he's, he's probably still around somewhere. Um, but the four of us, maybe the five of us, are um, content here for now, and we will wait your arrival in the next 50 or 60 years with great anticipation. Unfortunately, the, um, the communication array was somewhat damaged when Vector um, initiated the self-destruct sequence yesterday, so I think we only have enough power to send out this last transmission. Uh, but know that I am thinking of you, and I am hoping that you will join me soon. And when you when you arrive, um, make sure you come and say hi to me. Don't just ignore me when you uh, when you arrive. That would be that would be very strange. Um, but I've enjoyed this 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 conversation, this unidirectional communication, and um, I hope you have too. And I will see you soon in transmission. <laughs>